have a confession to make. This was done where, because I'm literally not at a good pl uh, place where I was so busy and a lot of things that I have to take care of. So then all of a sudden I wasn't sleeping at night. And then all of a sudden the Lord just gave it to me that night. So this was done at the moment. So it might be as heretical as you think that I talked to you about from those other people. But we shall see from the scriptures. But I shall tell you one thing, though, is that you have an amazing book. We are going to go smack dab in the middle of this book. And then we're going to spread it out to the very cover itself. To the very bookmark that you have right here in the center of the Bible. Shall we see how this works? So this, these are very interesting things. Let's look at the book of Hebrews chapter 13. One thing that we do know about the Lord Jesus Christ is that He will never leave us nor forsake us. So we can thank the Lord for that. The reason why is because at verse 8, Jesus Christ, and that all of history is dictated by Jesus Christ, the same what? Yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, if you know your history and your calendars, the one who makes it in the center and changes history is Jesus Christ. This is where you get your BCs from. Before Christ. And then smack dab in the middle Jesus and after that is AD. Jesus literally changes all of history. Amen. But let's see how much more interesting patterns we can find if this is truly smack dab in the middle. If this is what happened at time. And Jesus is timeless. you got to understand this, that God is that time means nothing to him. Why? Uh, time is not God. God is in charge of time. So time don't tell him what to do. Amen. Outside of time, he would, this is undoubtable in your scripture. Undoubtable is, is that whenever he talks about a future event, he'll use a past tense. Whenever he talks about a future event, it won't be tomorrow. It'll be a thousand years later. And then whenever he's, uh, and we know from 2 Peter, a day with the Lord is a thousand years, as a thousand years as one day. Time don't matter to God. He is the great I am that I am. King of kings and Lord of lords. Time don't tell him what to do. Jesus one time, what did he say to the Jews? He said, I am, and they knew what that meant. They knew what that meant. I am. Why? Because that is actually the form of God himself. That is his title. Only belonging to him. King of kings and Lord of lords. I am and that I am. And because Jesus is smack dab in the middle. Let's see how this works. So then when we, we see that Jesus Christ, he is the epicenter and he is undoubtedly the center. If we were to go a little bit after that, what happened? After the timeline of Jesus. Well, we do know this, that during the timeline, uh, after the timeline of Jesus Christ, God was concentrating on a group of people. that, And these people were originally not important. But then he started to let history pay attention to them now and not to his Jews. He paid attention to the Gentiles. And then if you look at the book of, turn to the book of Acts. Uh, Romans chapter 11, excuse me, Romans chapter 11, Romans chapter 11, Romans chapter 11. The times that we're living in is not the time of the nation of Israel. Their clock won't start until the tribulation. God literally paused the clock with the nation of Israel during the timeline of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the history was now being dictated, the kingdoms were now being dictated by the Gentiles, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and all the history books started to pay attention to them. Why do today's Gentiles pay attention to that history? Because it is the time of the Gentiles, not the Jews. So because of that, just like the Old Testament over here, the New Testament, we see that God started to let history pay attention to the Gentiles and not the Jews. Let's look at the book of Romans chapter 11 and we'll read verse 12. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the who? Gentiles. Gentiles. Why? The Jews, they were temporarily cut off. Look at verse 25. 
For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the what? Fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So it was the time of the Gentiles. Uh, if you know in your New Testament, God paid attention to the Gentiles. I'm going to start my program with them. Call Gentile dogs to receive salvation through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be the Gentiles who will be the missionary to the Jews. No longer the Jews who will be the missionaries to the Gentiles. And that goes, that goes the same thing right before the timeline of Jesus Christ. Who was attention toward? The Gentiles. The Gentiles. Not the Jews. Why? Because God temporarily cut off the Jews here. And what happened here? God temporarily cut off the Jews there. Now, pressing forward here. Then that means that the J Israel was permanently cut off later on. That's right. So then we see we hit the destruction of Jerusalem, right? So then the temple was no more. When God was turning toward the Gentiles, then God, God finally gave up the Jewish people. And then they lost their nation. And the children of Israel has been wandering ever since. And so because of that, the Jews were cut off at the first century. God was finished. Done was the Jews. The temple was no more. And thus started what they called their second diaspora. Why is that? It's reflecting their first diaspora. Right before God turned the attention toward the Gentiles, God, in the Old Testament, Old Testament, so New Testament, God turned to the Gentiles and then finally gave up the Jewish people temporarily. Over here, let's go backwards. Be the Gentiles, Babylon, Persia, but before them, before Babylon could even come in, the temple had to be destroyed. The temple was destroyed and Solomon's temple in its finest glory was never rebuilt again. They did try to rebuild it, but it was never restored to its former glory and neither did the Lord through Nehemiah or Ezra restore the nation of Israel. They were under their first diaspora. Look at that, how time goes. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. As we go forward, things go backwards. And that is fulfilled at Romans chapter 11, verse 25, that Israel was uh, cut aside temporarily. Let's go a little bit more forward here. Uh, then the Lord, he started to realize that these are the people in today's timeline. Go to the book of Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. The Lord says, then I'm going to use these Christians who are saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And these people will be the ones who will spread my gospel. Because why? These will be my nation of kings and priests. So during this timeline, you have kings and priests. And not only that, these Christians were not only kings and priests, they also became prophets. Verse 6, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. 19 verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the what? Spirit, Spirit of, prophecy. of prophecy. Revelation chapter 19 verse 10. Do you have the testimony of Jesus Christ? If you do have Jesus Christ in you, if you have that testimony, then you're a prophet. If we were to go back at the before the temple burn, it was a timeline in the nation of Israel of kings. And these were the kings that the Lord set up over his nation that time. But also it was a timeline where the priests were able to practice their work. And if you look at your Old Testament, let, I mean, go backwards before this. What is it? A book of prophets. But there was no person in the entire world of history who ever took the role of prophet, priest, and king. No one could take those three worlds. Only Jesus Christ. But you took that role. You took the role of prophet, priest, and king as his spiritual nation. How about that? And this is found at the timeline 
of the Old Testament. And then we get the timeline all the way from David, King David and Saul, and all the way down through the major and minor prophets. And then we consisted of kings, priests, and prophets. If we were to go a little bit more backwards then, okay, before the kings of that time, who were there before the kings? Look at the book of Judges. Look at the book of Judges. Look at the book of Judges, chapter 1. Judges, chapter 1. Judges chapter 1. It was a timeline where they failed God and then they went up. You might say, why is that? Because that was Israel's walk with God. In their walk with God, even though they were a special people, called out by God during the time of Judges, they lived during a time of cycle. And the cycle was you fall into sin, then you repent, and when you repent, usually the Lord will send some kind of preacher or preaching, get you right, and then after that you live for Him. But then after you live for Him, then what happens? Then you go back into sin, sin again, then you repent again, you get right on preaching, and then you live for God again, right? That was the timeline of Judges. <clears throat> Wait a minute. Now let's go forward here at the New Testament. At the New Testament, it was kings, priests, and prophets. We are special people of God. But as special people of God, we always have a problem of messing up in sin over and over again. And then we repent, and then we get right with God, and then we live for Him. But despite of uh, living for Him, then what happens? Then you sin again. And then you repent again. And then you hear Sunday preaching again. And then you get right with God. And then you live for Him. And then you sin again. And then uh, do you get the memo here? Mm -hmm. And why do you think that what men learn from history is that men never learn from history? You know why? Because there's something about history. It teaches about man. So that when I, dug, when I dug deeper into that, it's amazing that man follows the pattern of mankind, but even in a forward or a backward pattern. It is amazing. It is amazing. There is something to that. Look at the book of Judges, chapter 1. Look at the book of Judges, chapter 1. Now, uh, isn't, uh, look at this Bible here. Look at your King James Bible here. And time is endless, so to speak. Look at how the pages that is uncovering, we're seeing, let's look at the New Testament here, and then let's look at the Old Testament here. And look how it's going backwards right here. See that? Mm -hmm. We are literally going from the center and going down, 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 down until we reach the very covers itself and to that ribbon. Let's keep going on. Let's look at Judges chapter 1. Not bad for a bad night's sleep, right? Not bad for a bad night's sleep. <laughs> All right, let's look at the book of Judges chapter 1. Uh, we'll look at uh, chapter 2, actually, chapter 2, because this is pretty good. The Bible says that concerning about the uh, apostasy of is Israel, when we look at verse 20, And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he said, Because that this people hath transgressed my covenant, which I have commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice, I also will not henceforth drive out any more any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died, that through them I may prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein, as their fathers keep it or not. Now, does that sound like you? Okay, when we're reading this, it's so much like you. Just remember that. Look at verse 6. Uh, Let's look at verse four, uh, 15. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, there is your preacher, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges. This is you Monday after Sunday preaching. Yeah. <laughs> but they went a-whoring after other gods and bowed 
themselves unto them. They turned quickly, uh, quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in. Verse 18, And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. Verse 19, And it came to pass when the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them. That's you. So you can see that as you, this is your Christian walk. You sin, you repent, and then get right with God and preaching, and then you live. And it's what? A cycle. Your walk with God is a cycle and a cycle and a cycle. This is after you've been made what? King, priest, and prophet. After salvation. For the nation of Israel, it seems to go backwards. That's good. For the king, priest, and prophet, during before that time, they were doing this cycle. But as you keep going down on this cycle, what, do you, what happens in your life? What happens in your life uh, as you continue down this cycle, it goes on and on and you get discouraged, but then you conquer your discouragements. You keep pressing on for the Lord. And then what happens? What happens is you finally conquer your Jerichos. You finally conquer your enemies. And then you finally hit the promises that the Lord had promised to you, but you just never got your promises. Why? Because of your sin. You keep messing up. So you never seem to hit your promises. Finally, God's promises landed down on you once you got the victory. And if we were to go backwards before Judges, it would be Joshua. And Joshua, during his time, was a time of victory against his enemies. And why? Because they were entering the promised land. And as they were entering the promised land, uh, are you lost? Are you following what I'm saying over here? They were able to attain the promised land. Why? Because they were, they were able to conquer their enemies. Now, who says that book is not an amazing book after that? Okay, go to the book of Joshua, chapter 1, Joshua, chapter 1, Joshua, chapter 1. And then compare it to Romans, chapter 7, Romans, chapter 7. Look at Joshua, chapter 1, and let's look at Romans, chapter 7. Oh, I want the promises of God. I believe in that. Well, then you need to live in victory. You need to conquer your sins, your enemies. But it's a cycle. That's right, it's a cycle. But keep pressing on. You'll eventually attain right here in your next timeline. Just keep going. Keep serving God. It's an endless cycle, it seems like. But you're going to hit here. And that's what happened with Joshua case. In Joshua's case over here, the, the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. The enemies were conquered. And God was able to give them victory after victory because he gave them a wonderful promise. And the Jews got it. They were reaching their promised land. Why not hit your promised land? Why not sing dwelling in Beulah land like you mean it this time? Conquer, but just keep pressing on. What did Joshua say to the Jews at Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8? This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then sh thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. You win prosperity. You win if you follow the word of God. Romans chapter 7. It is such an endless cycle. But you attain victory eventually. The Bible says at uh, verse 20, Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Uh, verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? See, it goes on. But look at this. Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, you finally get the victory through that endless cycle of back and forth. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. All right? Are you more interested to see what will happen next in your timeline after this? Yeah. Or uh, let's look at a little bit more, shall we? Let's look at a little bit more of what's going to happen to you at your timeline. If we go before the book of Joshua, we do know that the nation of the children of Israel, that they were in bondage in Egypt as slaves. 
and they were sick and tired. The, the bondage was very, very grievous. And the Bible says that it was very sore. And they cried to God, and it seemed like that the Lord, you know, that he didn't really hear their cries. Until finally, the Lord sent out a shepherd. And this shepherd, whose name was Moses, through a shepherd's rod, was able to finally deliver God's people. And they were able to get out of Egypt. So that why? They can begin to enter their promised land. And that is the story of Moses. If we look forward into our life, uh, we are bound into this wicked world system which Egypt represents. Egypt represents the world. And then in this wicked world, we want to be free and delivered. So then the Lord sends out that great shepherd named Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, through his rod and staff, they comfort me. Psalms chapter 23. And then he will give a call to his sheep at John chapter 10. And my sheep will hear my voice and they will know it. And he will get them finally out of this world because we've been in bondage far too long in this wicked world. And we were crying in tears. And God will just finally get us out of there so that we can be at home at, in glory at the promised land with him. Amen. Now, who says that King James Bible is a boring book or you can't observe that? Why? Because we're, uh, Moses and the children of Israel, they pass through the Red Sea. It is by through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ we pass through that sea of glass. Amen. So we are not of the Bible says. We are not of this world. Egypt represents the world, and we are not of this world. Let's look at uh, two passages, John chapter 10. And then we'll also look at the book of oh, let's look at the book of Exodus, shall we? The book of Exodus. So let's look at John chapter 10. And then we're going to turn to our Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. Something else about that book. And it's so interesting when you look at mankind's history. When you look at mankind's history. How when we go forward, things just seem to go backward. And even more literally. What I mean by literally is literally that book you're holding in your hand. We're just going like this through the page. Yes. <laughs> So literally that history has to split in half to B.C. and A.D. So literally that the Bible has to call it New Testament and Old Testament. Wow. All right, let's look at the book of Exodus chapter 14. What did Moses say when the Egyptians pursued after them? The Bible says at verse... 13, and Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today for the Egyptians whom ye have seen today. Ye shall see them again no more forever. If you look at John chapter 10, and it's through the rod that he did that, right? With the shepherd's staff, he was able, uh, look at verse 16, but lift up thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. It's a, through a shepherd. Look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10. There are so many verses we can dig, but we're not going to go there. What does Psalms chapter 23 say? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You know why? Because we get to laugh at death when God pulls us through with that rod. We get raptured up alive, bless God. Well, I don't believe in that shepherd illustration. You don't read Bible. Look at John chapter 10. Look at John chapter 10. Verse, verse 3. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them what? Out. out. He's getting them out. Why? To go to up there at verse, uh, to go up there at heaven. At uh, verse 1 and 2, where the porter is. How about that? What's he getting them out to get them in? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we see over here, it has to do with getting out of this world and going to heaven. That's so obvious. Okay, uh, but what did the, uh, look at Romans 13. Romans 13. Romans 13. 
Moses says, Fear ye not, stand still, see the salvation of, your, of the Lord your God. Yeah. Our salvation is nigh when we will leave this wicked world, leave Egypt behind, yeah. and when we go raptured up with him in glory. Our yeah. salvation is nearer yeah. than we believe. Look at the book of Romans chapter 13, verse 11. And that knowing the time, that it, now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. You know what that is. That is your rapture. Yeah. All right, let's go a little bit backwards now. All right. How about that? Wow, it's amazing about that book. But now we're seeing something really, really cool. All right. Now let's see Genesis here unfold. And it seems to be Genesis backwards with Revelation forward. Shall we take a look? Okay, well, uh, let's think about this. Uh, before Moses, we do know this. Joseph is the greatest type of Jesus Christ you will ever find in the Bible. There is no doubt about that. So let's look at several of these cases here. The first one is Joseph, greatest type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was able to get his people to the land of Egypt and set up a home base over there. In the book of Revelation, the, pe the person who tries to... Picture Jesus Christ more than anybody is the devil. Satan will try to picture and imitate and copycat Jesus Christ so close that people will mistake him to be Christ alone. And then comes the Antichrist. And the Antichrist, he will lead his people to his own home base, which is called, go to Revelation 11, Egypt. Egypt. Oh. Go to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Turn to your Bibles to Revelation chapter 11. Joseph is the greatest person ever in the Bible that will picture Jesus Christ. I mean, Arthur W. Pink took it so much that he put like a hundred or something. And Dr. Upman says, uh, I won't go that far, but I do know this. Un undoubtedly, Joseph, it, greatest picture. No other person will top it. Well, then, you see right here, Satan will do the same thing. He's going to get his Christ to picture Jesus Christ so much that people will mistake him to be Christ. Oh, wow. Look at Revelation chapter 11. And both of them take the people and establish the home base in Egypt. Look at Revelation chapter 11. Look at verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and what? Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So that's the Antichrist home base. Uh, let's go a little bit more backward. When we go to Joseph, we come to the timeline of the patriarchs and the tribes of Israel. So then we see 12 tribes of Israel, and then we see the list of the patriarchs of that time. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So then we see Jacob here. And his people. Let's look at Revelation chapter 7. God sets up the 12 tribes right over here. And what does he call the timeline of the tribulation? Jacob's trouble. Now, I don't know how I got this in a blink of a moment out of sleep, all right? <laughs> Let's just say that the Lord, that, that the Lord gave, me, gave me a little something, perhaps. Look at Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. Yeah, I was at a serious point. I was like, Lord, I'm serious. I don't have anything to teach. I don't know what to do. So you have to do something. And the Lord's like, teach this, stupid. And I'm like, that's a great idea. <laughs> God's like, see, I take care of you. All right? Amen, Amen brother. All right. All right, let's look at verse 4, Revelation 7, verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And what you're going to find out, it's 12 from verses 5 through 8. It is 
12 tribes. If you look up the word Jacob's trouble in your Bible, that's the timeline of the tribulation. Uh, let's go backwards now, okay? Even more backwards. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 tribes. Before that... We, uh, we got to realize that uh, bef it's even between, between. We're not right there yet, actually. <laughs> We're not right there yet. But before I continue on with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 tribes, okay? Remember, these people, God says, I call you out of this wicked system, which is Nimrod's Babylonian religious system that time. God says, I'm calling you out of there. What did God with the, do with these 12 tribes? I'm calling you out of this Antichrist. Nimrod's one of, the, one of the types of the Antichrist out of this Babylonian Nimrod system. The place that we will go then is the Tower of Babel. And if you know about the Tower of Babel, that's when Nimrod, your first Antichrist, so to speak, set up his new world order and he was going to establish. But that was an early motherland of this place, which you don't realize is Babylon. Revelation 17. Revelation 17. I think I'm going to hit at the center here. That way people can look at both wordings here. Like a Revelation 17. Didn't you know that? Tower of Babel is the spiritual mother homeland of this Babylon, the great whore of Revelation later on. It's the, it's the spiritual origins continued on to here. Both of them New World Order system. Revelation chapter 17, verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Why? Because the Antichrist is saying, we're going to set up a new world order kingdom and we're going to battle God. We're going to reach up heaven. We're going to do it. Tower of Babel, let's all get together and let's just reach up to heaven. How about that? When we go forward, it's just going backwards. Then if we keep going backwards over here, uh, what does uh, we see Noah's Ark, obviously. So then the flood, we see the days of Noah. The flood, which represents God's wrath, the sons of God who intermingled, mm -hmm. and then we see God's judgment falling. Mm -hmm. And then a small group of people, a remnant, mm -hmm. surviving. Yeah. A people, Noah's Ark. The Bible says about the tribulation, it shall be like the days of Noah. And then what does God do? At the days of Noah, he spreads his wrath upon them. He pours out the vials, the trumpets, and the seals. And then a small remnant is the one who survives out of it. The tribulation saint. And during that time, the days of Noah, the Bible says in the book of Luke, they were giving in marriage, uh, they were marrying, given in marriage. Why? Because of Genesis 6, those sons of God were intermingling. We're not going to look at those passages because I said it quite a dozen times. Yeah. Daniel chapter 2 right here, Genesis chapter 6. The sons of God intermingled with humans at Genesis and at Revelation, the sons of God will intermingle again with the humans, Daniel chapter 2. All right, let's go backwards, all right? This might, let's keep, let's go, let's fast forward a little bit as we go backwards. Does that make sense? So let's fast forward, let's fast forward and rewind, okay, real fast. All right, days of Noah. Let's go before that. Then we see at this timeline, Cain, where he persecuted and murdered Abel. All right, go to the book of Jude. Jude. Book of Jude. If you compare that, well, we'll go to Matthew 23, too. All right, yeah, that's, good. that's good, too. That way you can get a complete picture. The Bible says that during the tribulation, they go after the gainsaying and the religious system of Cain, and these people are responsible for the blood of God's prophet. But it started out, God's prophet who was persecuted, God starts out with Abel. But then the end will be the what? The tribulation saints who are the prophets. The blood of the prophets poured out. Why? Because of the religion of Cain. Yeah. The religion of Cain will be revived. It is a system of man's efforts and sweat and blood and tears. And your sheep 
is a threat to my system. Their sheep, Jesus Christ, is a threat to their hardworking system in the tribulation. Don't bring Jesus in. Look at the book of Jude. The Bible prophesied that it would be a timeline where people will actually revive the system of Cain. Look at verse 11. So Jude is about last days. Didn't you know that? And for those of you who don't believe it, look at verse 18. It says last days. <laughs> prophesying about tribulation. Now look at what's going to happen at the tribulation. Verse 11. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of what? Cain. Cain. And ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. It's the religion of Cain that time. Let's go backwards a bit more. Before Cain murdered Abel, and there's just no room anywhere, the Lord put a flaming sword so that no one will be able to enter inside the Garden of Eden. Go to Revelation 19, and we're not going to read it for time's sake. The Lord gives out a flaming sword at Armageddon and strikes down his enemy. Why? The flaming sword at the Garden of Eden made a distinction that God's Garden of Eden will, not, will be distinguished and separated from the wicked, sinful place. Over here, Revelation, God has to provide his Garden of Eden at the millennium and he has to divide the wicked, sinful place and clean house with his flaming sword. How about that? Then that means then if you go backwards even more, then it should be obvious. The Garden of Eden. And what did the Bible say about the millennium? It will be a timeline just like what? Eden. So then it will be like Eden restored at the millennium. So then like Eden... It will be the timeline of the millennium. 1,000 years of happiness, paradise on earth, just like the Garden of Eden. If we were to go even more backwards at, uh, behind that, now how far back can we go? Well, when we go far, uh, even further than that, the Lord, go to Second Peter, uh, write down 2 Peter 3 now, 2 Peter 3. But uh, it is the Lord's judgment on the universe. And his judgment on the universe was by fire. His judgment of the universe was by fire. Why? Because uh, his judgment of the universe by fire at the tribulation. So I'm at over here at Genesis. Sorry, I'm going backwards. It's a circle, remember? It's a circle. So if we were to go at God's universal judgment, it's by fire at the book of Revelation. We know that, right? So then God... Uh, gets rid of all the universe by fire. Why? Because he made a promise. He made a promise that I will no longer judge with water. And then that is found at 2 Peter chapter 3. What happens? God says at the latter end of 2 Peter 3, the universe, the earth and heavens will be judged by fire. But then if you go back more verses, God says that at Genesis, he judged the universe and the heavens by water. That's Genesis 1, 1 and 2. Why? Your Genesis gap. That's where God judged the entire universe and cleaned house. How about that? See, there's a pattern here. That's one good reason why the gap theory would make sense. It would make... See that right here? Look at this pattern. But let's go even more backwards after that. If we go backwards before that, we're living, we're living at a timeline where people are living... Happily ever after, there are heavenly beings. And this person used to be perfect. His name was Lucifer. And these heavenly beings were living before the judgment. Before their judgment, there were heavenly beings. Before they were judged by water. Heavenly beings living out throughout, I guess, what you can call the timeline of eternity. We don't know how long, but we do know they were there for a span of time. They were there for a span of time. Now, here's your crazy stuff here, and I just don't have any room over here. So let's just do this, okay? Let's just go this way, and then this way. That way you can somewhere hit at the middle, maybe. I'm just running out of space here. You see, at the future, there's going to be heavenly beings. And these heavenly beings, if Larkin is right about his statement, which you don't know, 
But if Larkin is right about his statement at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that there's going to be a timeline throughout the eternity stages where people will be living about 33,000 years or something like that. So we're getting really deep now. There are people who are going to live a span of time during eternity with God up in heaven just as long as perhaps maybe these heavenly beings. This will happen during the timeline of eternity. Well, then where does it go back to before these heavenly beings? In the beginning, in the beginning, God. And then if Larkin is true, according to 1 Corinthians 15, the Bible says that Christ, it, it goes all back to him. So then it goes back to God. And thus he is Alpha and he is Omega. Now, what do you see right here? It is a quite an interesting circular pattern. I don't know about Larkin's theory if it's true or not, but I believe this is that if I want to study more into the scriptures, then I'm going to get into every Bible teacher and then find out more of the truth myself. And I want to study it in my own time. And so should you. So these are stuff that you should uh, know about so you can be familiar and look into it more yourself after that. But then it shows right over here that Jesus Christ, he truly says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. But that's not where we end. We went all the way forward to the end of your Bible. And we went all the way to the end of the Bible. So we got to talk about the cover and everything else over here. So then when you look at this Bible cover, it is divided into two parts for some weird reason. It is divided to 39 books in your Old Testament and 27 books in your New Testament. So it seems like the uh, Old Testament era is like a longer portion, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And the New Testament era is a shorter portion, so to speak. If you believe in 2 Peter chapter 3 about Dr. Upman's teaching about the seven sevens where eternity where we hit through millennium and reach completion will be 7,000 years. If we go by that, well, then that means that this is true then. Then the 4,000 years, which makes up the greater majority of your Old Testament, 39 books, and that leaves only a little bit time left, which is good news for us. That means only a little bit of time left. And then if Dr. Upman's dating system is right, 2,000 years. Well, then we're, we're uh, he's wrong on that. We passed the year 2000 already. You don't know your calendar system. It's messed yeah. up, all right? It's messed up. Pe uh, we went through so many calendar system datings that we don't know what year we're at. But we do know this is that we're not too far away looking at current times. Yeah. And guess what? Oh, 2,000 years. It's shorter than this one. Why? Because the New Testament books are shorter than your Old Testament books. But if we were to get a little bit more further after that, you know, coincidentally, the Lord says that this whole timeline of mankind, Old Testament, New Testament, about the story of man, which is the amazing thing. The Lord never made a book about the story of Lucifer and the fallen beings. Just indications he slipped in there. The Lord never made a 5,000 page history book on just the Gentile history. It's the history of man in biblical history. So because of the history of man, for some weird reason, and it's divided into two portions here. Two portions here. If we take Revelation 13, the number six is what? The number of what? Man. But then it's two portions of his history right here. And there are 66 books in that King James Bible right there. Yeah. But why won't he add another six? Because you know what that is. Yeah. That's the devil. What does Satan want to do? He wants to add humanism right here. He wants to add his own humanism here. Uh, what, did, uh, what, what did Hitler want? A thousand year Reich. Mm -hmm. See that? So see, Satan wants to start his own new timeline. Let's add another six over here. But God says, no, man has to stop short right here at six. Why? Because there's another number that's stopping short of completion. If we went beyond six, man went beyond six, we'd reach the number of perfection and completion where the Lord ended time. And that is the seventh day. Seven is God's number. 
So then why is man 66 right here? Because two parts of man, we can only stop short here. We can never reach completion. Until we get that king of kings and lord of lords, we're going to hit number seven. And then when we hit seven, time will be no more, as the Bible says. And it completely folds and closes up. And Jesus Christ is king of kings and lord of lords. So what do we do with our history books? With our history books... We see right here that this is mankind, but then it's about to close up. And it's going to be only Jesus Christ that completes all of time because the Word of God in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When you have this closed book, all you see is the Word. And guess what the Word is titled after? Jesus Christ. Amen. When time of man will close up, all you see is the Word, Jesus Christ. But uh, let's close it off over here. What Then what does this ribbon represent, Pastor? This ribbon represents where you are. You're reading your Bible, and you're applying something to yourself that the Lord is speaking to you. So as you use this ribbon, it's free choice. And in free choice, that's something that time don't even have power against. And in your free choice over here, where, which timeline are you following? And applying and learning to yourself so that you don't follow the cyc cyclical pattern of mankind's fallibility. Wow. Let's close with a word of prayer. <laughs> God, my Father, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. And thank you so much for giving me this teaching, Lord. It can only be birthed through uh, conflict and uh, where I don't have time because that way you can get greater glory. That way this teaching is yours. And nothing that I create from hours and hours of study. Just from you in a blink of an eye. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good night. Amen.